we are going to start out with a series of slides and follow that with a, uh, a video. Uh, of course, the slides and also the video are silent. We will provide the narration. And we hope that what we can do, uh, although it's not totally adequate, but what we hope to do is show you uh, a slice of what it's like to be on orbit and uh, to conduct a mission, a fantastic mission such as STS-80. So if we could queue up the uh, first slide, we'll get started. Well, the one thing we know is that you can't have a mission until you have a patch. <laughs> and uh, I was assigned as patch chairman on this flight, so my, my goal was to come up with a patch that told a little bit of story about the mission. And before I get started, I can't necessarily take credit for this design logo. Mike Sandy, who uh, was a, an artist for Lockheed Martin, who's moved back east now, came up with this design. But what the design tells you, in the uh, center top portion of the patch is the Orpheus Spa satellite, the uh, spectrograph astronomy satellite that we deployed on day one. Connected it at the bottom of the three red lines, which are a portion of the astronaut symbol, and those are there to represent, in fact, the astronaut office involvement with these satellites. The two satellites we took up were both free flyers <coughs> and for a large portion did a lot of science on their own. But we would like to emphasize our portion in getting in there and help conducting the science. At the bottom portion, that is the wake shield satellite that the uh, story was in was deeply involved with the entire time it was deployed. You'll notice in the dark blue background there are stars. There are 16 white stars represent a day for each, or one star for each day of the flight. There's also two larger blue stars, which were to represent the EVAs. And <coughs> I've got to tell you now, when I put those on, I was also hopeful that we would wind up with the record duration mission. So if you count those two, that's 18 days. And in fact, that's what our mission turned out to be. <laughs> Pretty clever. <laughs> I did that on my last flight and we didn't get that extra day. <laughs> the, uh, and then lastly, around the perimeter, the uh, gray area where the names are encompassed, if you look at that and kind of remove the shuttle, you'll see a C. And uh, the, it's kind of appropriate that that C stands for Columbia. Uh, or the Commander Cockrell also <laughs> enjoyed that C. <laughs> but the, uh, and then obviously the center of the patch, what we really wanted to tell also was the space shuttle mission. And there's the on-orbit configuration of the space shuttle while we conducted the science. And we can go on to the next slide. We took off on a beautiful day in the afternoon in Florida. And uh, this is probably about three seconds into the flight. By the time we get to the top of the tower, we're going uh, 120 miles per hour. But the real excitement for the crew is during those last three or four seconds prior to the boosters lighten. Uh, I think NASA does a countdown so that it can make the crew uh, more scared when it, when it comes time for the boosters to light. But we were, we were in the hooping and hollering mode at this point. Well, one of the first activities during the mission was the deployment of the Orpheus Spas spacecraft. We grappled the Spas about three and a half hours into the flight, and we were set up for a seven hour deploy. We ended up deploying about eight and a half hours to, to get some of the ground configuration. Um, corrected before we did the actual deploy. But uh, Orpheus Spas is a spacecraft that was born out of a joint agreement between NASA and the German Space Agency. And it consists of the Spas carrier and the Orpheus suite of uh, telescopes and instruments built by b in the United States and in Germany. And they take ultraviolet spectra, or look at light um, of higher energy than optical light, of things like uh, stars in our own galaxy, other galaxies, and also look at the material between the stars to get a better understanding of the star formation process. Well, along with the deploy came a fairly large photo TV requirement overhead. And that helped to make our day one not only busy, but very busy. And this is a photo of Tom in the middle of that, of that nest. And as a matter of fact, along with that went a five recorder setup. He's, in, he's holding a checklist, and I'd like to mention Martha May and the photo TV. She designed this checklist, and without her help, we would have never pulled this off like we did. We'll skip ahead a bit here to flight day four, and we were busy here uh, deploying the Wake Shield facility, our other prime payload on the, on the flight, and I'm operating the um, uh, RMS controls at the aft flight deck looking back into the payload bay. And we um, deployed the Wake Shield after a long uh, period of orbiter free drift where we didn't fire the orbiter's thrusters to keep contamination of the wake shield's experimental side to a minimum. And it was a very nice ballet uh, designed by uh, our friends in Mission Control to put together this, this uh, ballet and choreograph the release of the wake shield. 
while we maneuvered the uh, satellite to the uh, various positions on the arm that required to get it in uh, deploy configuration. Here you can see um, the wake shield being unberthed from the payload bay. And uh, we removed it from the protective cone in the back of the uh, payload bay that kept the uh, experimental surface, the growth surfaces, free from contamination during the uh, launch pad stay of the ascent and early part of orbit. And as we lift it up here, we go into a complicated sequence of maneuvers to clean off the experimental bottom of the wake shield or the wake side of the satellite. And Story will tell us a bit more about that science. Here's the wake shield after uh, Thomas released it. Uh, management of the wake shield program and the science that's conducted on it is out of the University of Houston. It's manufactured right across the water there in uh, South Shore Harbor by Spacecraft Industries. Uh, wake shield is a satellite to study the manufacture of semiconductor materials out there in a perfect vacuum of 10 to the minus 14. It's uh, battery operated, has thermal passive system, it has its own attitude a determination system that looks at Earth horizon, and it controls its attitude with torquers, the iron structures that you can see, magnetic torquers, and a reaction control wheel. It performed absolutely perfectly on this mission. Here we are on board uh, operating wake shield. Uh, we do that using portable computers. Uh, I used a pilot seat here and I strapped uh, two personal computers to the pilot seat and uh, it looked something like a pipe organ where you had different kinds of keyboards. Uh, one of those computers was used for monitoring the system and the other was for sending commands to it. Well, the, uh, the scientists and mission specialists on the mission were real excited about the science on going on the Lake Shield. But the pilots, we're pretty excited about the fact we get a rendezvous with it to pick it back up. So here's Taco at the aft station on rendezvous day, our flight day seven. The uh, wake shield had accomplished all the science it attempted during this mission, which was a pretty aggressive schedule. And uh, Taco's at the aft station flying that rendezvous on flight day seven. It's not a one-person show getting rendezvoused with a uh, with an orbiting satellite. Of course, it's a team of. Uh, scores of people on the ground and in flight, and uh, each crew member's got a job to do, and in the case of this flight, we wanted to take some independent measures of the distance of the satellite and the rate that it was closing on us, and we use a police laser uh, speed gun to do that. That's exactly what that is. It uh, is something you may have seen face to face in, <laughs> in your everyday walk of life. And uh, it's a very accurate machine, and we had Tammy uh, stretched out across the cockpit looking up at the two satellites uh, on each of the rendezvous, uh, measuring their speed and the distance from us. Meanwhile, somebody has to run the show while I'm back having fun doing the uh, flying. And up until the time that we take over the manual flying, uh, Rommel here in the, in the commander's seat did the, uh, orb the trajectory adjustment burns that are used to uh, get us right on track to be ready to rendezvous with the uh, whichever satellite we're going after. And he also monitors all the systems on board Columbia, which uh, I might point out were working perfectly and, and uh, gave us no trouble at all. Here's a shot of the wake shield uh, just after um, uh, grapple, and we're swinging it from the uh, grapple position into the payload bay again to be berthed on flight day seven. In the background there, it's a very pretty view of the Pacific Ocean uh, the Gulf of California on the right, and the, s the <coughs> island off the coast of the Baja Peninsula is the Island of the Guardian Angels uh, in Mexico. And we had a spectacular view of the, of the uh, wake shield orbiter and the Earth below throughout all of these phases of the flight. And it just takes your breath away when you're trying to work in the payload bay and something goes skimming by in, in the background <coughs> as spectacular as this. Here we have our wake shield RMS operator. Tom did um, all of the RMS operations um, on the wake shield. And here he's performing some attached ops, meaning the arm is attached to wake shield, uh, the day after we did the retrieval. And you can see um, the wake shield uh, through the aft window and the tail. And of course, all of this is done against uh, the backdrop of the earth as we orbit uh, around it. This slide's in here to represent some of the mid-deck science experiments we had on board, and especially mid-flight about now, it's day seven, eight, nine or so. The, uh, we had a pretty large host of mid-deck experiments. The one that Tammy is working here is 
called View CPL. It's a capillary pumped loop, which the concept of it is to try to prove out that we can, in fact, pump a loop to remove heat from instruments in space without using a mechanical pump, but rather using the fluid mechanics properties as well as heat to drive it. Prior to doing a spacewalk, we do an extensive checkout of uh, the space suits and the life support systems on the back. Uh, several days before going to do the EVA, we also configure and un unstow all the tools and arrange them in the airlock so that we've choreographed that tool flow before going out uh, the door. This is EVA day here, and uh, Tammy's getting suited up, and uh, you can see uh, me in the picture too, uh, my hand down there to the left uh, putting on Tammy's glove. <laughs> getting suited up, I'm called the IV person. All the suits, all the tools, everything we did on board uh, performed absolutely flawlessly and they were ready to support a spacewalk. Well, as everyone knows, um, a screw and a mechanism in the hatch precluded us from performing mm -hmm. the EVAs and Tom and I had a lot of creative ideas about how we might actually get that hatch open. And we also had a number of tools on board, not just the EVA tools, but the IFM tools. And so we went looking through the bag of tricks and, and chose a hammer and a crowbar, which also might be used as a chisel, and uh, took this photograph in jest uh, as if we were going to go and uh, take one more crack at the hatch before we called it a day. Dividing up the slides to see who will talk <laughs> about them. It's uh, normally a democratic process, but uh, the vote in this case was uh, four to one that I would be the, end, the one to end up talking about this. Uh, washing your hair on orbit turns out is not much different than, uh, than washing your hair down here. Especially for you, Story. Especially for me. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. But you don't want to put too much stuff on it because you haven't got that much uh, water to. Uh, to get it off, Can but uh, <laughs> just like, it's somewhat like, uh, you know, washing a car, you get too much soap on it down here, but some people wash their cars and other people polish them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tammy took the liberty of converting uh, some of the orbiter air conditioner system to her own personal hair dryer, <laughs> and she was, uh, hands down, the one that needed a hair dryer the most on board. What we'd like to do now is go ahead and show you some of the Earth observation slides that we've got. And uh, this one just came out beautifully, and all five of us claim we're the ones that took it. But the, uh, <laughs> what this is is the Sinai Peninsula, the Red Sea on the left side, and from the leg of the Sinai from the Red Sea, the Suez Canal is on the right. Just above it is the Nile Delta. Cairo is in there. There are some pyramids in there. We actually shot the pyramids in space. And uh, fortunately for me, the pyramids are very close to what I thought, where I thought the pyramids were, so they didn't come out in my slide. And then the Nile, you can see the Nile above the, the Red Sea with, with the large bend in it. Also, I'd just like to point out the curvature of the Earth. And uh, something that's always stuck out to me is how black space is. It is absolutely the starkest, blackest black I've ever seen, especially next to the Earth. We spend a lot of our time over water uh, in an equatorial or 28 degree uh, inclined orbit. Um, and most of the time, you just pay attention to the clouds only in passing. However, um, late in the flight, on a, on a couple of our wave off days that got added to the end of the flight, we glanced down in the Indian Ocean while we were strapped into our seats waiting for the deorbit burn that never came and saw Cyclone Daniela here in the Indian Ocean off the east coast of Madagascar. And uh, we watched this storm over a couple of successive days and were able to get some uh, pictures of this hurricane down in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the eye is very well defined there and penetrates right down to the sea surface. And the other detail that you might notice is that the spiral bands of this storm are uh, in a clockwise direction. And that's just the opposite of uh, hurricanes up here in the northern hemisphere. So you can really see uh, Coriolis forces at work in the different hemispheres. And this was the only big hurricane we saw in 18 days. So we managed to grab it at the end of the flight, thanks to the extension days. This is a uh, view of one of the islands in the Bahamas, the Great Exuma Island. And to the right, uh, on the dark portion, you can see the tongue of the ocean. The depth of that water is about 3,000 feet, whereas the depth close to the island is about 10 feet. So there's a, a tremendous gradient in depth um, over a very short distance. 
I must say that I'm always struck um, in particular by the coastlines when I view the Earth from orbit. The blues and greens um, around the, the chain of islands in the Bahamas is extraordinarily beautiful, and I, I wish that you could all enjoy such a view. This is probably uh, the winner of the Most Photographed Spot Award on STS-80. It's Mount Everest, the, the highest peak on the planet, just a bit over 29,000 feet. And it's the, the large mountain right at the center of the picture, uh, with a very large shadow going off to the upper right. Um, to the right of this picture is the, the high plateau of Tibet, average altitude about three miles above sea level. And stretching uh, towards uh, Mount Everest is a very deep V-shaped valley that uh, makes it easy for us as crew members to identify it from space. When you pick up that valley, you can walk right up it to the left there to Mount Everest in the center of the picture. And surrounding the mountain are a number of glaciers uh, coated with boulders that you can see in the fine uh, detail um, in some of our pictures. Off to the left would be the Indian side of the subcontinent here. And of course, Mount Everest is shoved up to the heights it's uh, reached because India is sliding from the left, it's cramming into the uh, Asiatic continent and thrusting these mountains skyward. One of the prettiest uh, mountain chains that we saw anywhere on the planet. This is a, a view of Mount Pinatubo, which is a volcano in the Philippines on the island of Luzon. Uh, it erupted several years ago, and we continue to photograph it. And of, of note in this photograph, down in the lower left corner is uh, Clark Air Base. You can just see the runway uh, running sort of up to the left and down to the right. And the mud flows that are coming down from this mountain after, after the eruption, a lot of the vegetation was removed, and so the, the mountain is eroding at a, a more rapid pace than would be normal for, a, for an older mountain that has all of its vegetation in place. The Earth Observation scientists here at JSC track con, uh, successive photographs of uh, places like this and can use that to uh, determine how ecologically uh, various areas of the world are being affected by the changes that have occurred to them. Sometimes we go after very specific targets on the Earth with our Earth observation uh, photos. We have a list that's sent up each day from uh, mission control with our targets for the day, the, b the best opportunities for looking at change on the globe, for example, or weather phenomenon. But sometimes we just shoot the pictures for aesthetics. And here we are, way out over the Pacific Ocean, uh, well west of Christmas Island and well southwest of Hawaii, over nowhere in particular. But the sun was going down to the west, and we caught the cloud layers and the sun glint in a nice golden glow there, and it's just one of the prettiest sights. The clouds here are almost three-dimensional as they float above the surface of the Pacific here. And we all had a keen eye for these shots thanks to Story. I think he was more aesthetically inclined than the rest of us uh, in his views out the window, and he always called attention to spectacular sights like these. This is the island of Oahu, one of the islands in the Hawaiian chain. It uh, is a well-eroded uh, uh, extinct volcano. We passed over the Hawaiian chain uh, every day. We got a lot of good photos of it because a lot of times it was clear, and also we passed over the islands uh, during the crew awake period and when the Earth was lit at this point. At the very bottom of the slide there, uh, you can see a straight structure on the bottom shoreline. That is uh, Honolulu International Airport, uh, Hickam Air Force Base. You can see the body of water on the bottom, that is uh, Pearl Harbor. To the very right lower is uh, Diamond Head and the beach above from that is Waikiki Beach. The very uh, top of the slide is Waimea Bay, the north shore where they have a very large surf. Uh, some personal uh, thoughts on that slide is I do have a boy that lives down there in the bottom in Honolulu. Off to the right, uh, Kanioe Bay, I was stationed in the Marine Corps there 40 years ago. Uh, we did wave off two extra days, and that brought us to a landing on uh, Pearl Harbor Day. Well, here we are on flight day 15, um, having rendezvoused with the uh, Orpheus spas and preparing to retrieve it. One thing you might notice about this space uh, spacecraft is that it's equipped with, equipped with some black and white dots. And those dots were used um, as part of the space vision system experiment which is basically um, a camera and some computer smarts that looks at the position of these dots on an object like a spacecraft and determines things like position and attitude very, very accurately. And we're hoping to use the space station, the space vision system 
uh, when we construct the space station. And so we wanted to perform some tests on that system. And the Orpheus Spas folks were kind enough to let us use their spacecraft as a test bed. But on flight day 15, we did rendezvous with Orpheus and retrieved it after uh, 14 successful days of data acquisition on a variety of astronomical objects. Uh, here we are on what we thought was landing day. Uh, we got a tremendous amount of practice at deorbit preparation. <laughs> but uh, Story and I were responsible for suiting up our crew members and then, of course, ourselves. And here you can see we have our commander suited up um, in preparation for his uh, landing of the shuttle, actually a couple days later. And uh, we're all very proud of him. And as you can see, the smile on Story's face, uh, he's very excited um, about the prospects of waving off. <laughs> all good things have to come to an end. We didn't have to land on flight day 18. We actually had enough uh, fuel on board uh, Columbia to uh, fly uh, three or four more days. Uh, we were out of some of uh, the undergarments that you might want to use uh, for successive days, <laughs> and we were also um, running a little bit of short on food. We, we had lots of uh, food that maybe Yule Gibbons would like, but we were kind of short on the, the basics and entrees. But we weren't ready to land. We were, we were happy where we were. We'd, I think by around the 10th or 11th day, we were uh, very acclimated to zero G and to living in this little environment uh, of the space shuttle and uh, enjoying it very much and having such a great time that we could have gone on for much longer. The uh, landing that we were given was about 15 minutes prior to sunrise. Uh, it goes in the books officially as a, a day, day landing, but it looked dark enough to me to log it in my personal logbook as a night landing. Uh, so. It, it did give us a beautiful view, and, and here we are as we are approaching touchdown with the uh, xenon lights illuminating us from behind, and you can see the humidity in the Florida air has is, is, uh, turned into some vapor. And then before you switch off the slide, Taco, I'd just like to add that the, uh, as pilots, Taco and I are trained for months and months, hundreds of landings and practices to try to touch down, hopefully within plus 10, minus 15 knots of the speed that we're supposed to touch down. And the point we touched down can vary. On this day, we were supposed to touch down around 3,100 feet. Though Taco won't mention it, but I'm, what I'd like to tell you is he absolutely nailed it. We touched down at 3,100 feet. We touched down inside of two knots of the touchdown speed. And what along came with that was a touchdown that was so smooth that the, uh, as I was calling off the speeds, I really wasn't certain if we'd touched down or not. But I knew because my HUD mo moded into the touchdown mode, and I felt a little bit of vibration, which were the wheels spinning up on the rollout. So I'd just like to add that Taco. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely nailed that. And I figured it's worth 100 more yeah. instead of a 20. <laughs> That's it for our slide presentation. And as soon as you can cue it up, we're ready for the video. There it is. While Columbia sat on the launch pad, the uh, five of us were uh, having breakfast and then getting suited up. Uh, here I am uh, waving to the kids. Rommel is uh, just about to go through the pressure check of his uh, uh, launch and entry suit, and that's what Tammy is doing here as well. These suits are not totally uncomfortable, but they're not the kind of thing that you'd like to wear. Here's Tom. Uh, for any extended period of time, and, and getting into and out of them is not real pleasant. So it was nice that we launched on the first day. Uh, it would have been, uh, well, it was, a, it was a reasonable trade to have to get in and out of the suit two or three times in order to um, get the extra couple of days on orbit. <coughs> launch day was absolutely a beautiful day, something that new to me. On my last flight, I climbed in the vehicle several times before we went anywhere. Here the engines are lightened six seconds prior to liftoff. The, the vehicle stack goes through its twang, but when the, solid, when the solids light like this, there's no doubt in your mind you're going somewhere. We had a cadence. Tom started it. He said 102, 102. The computers were in mode 102. I said auto, auto. Pitch and roll yaws were in auto and not CSS. And Taco was supposed to say, go, there goes the tower. But by the time he could say, there goes the tower, the tower had already gone. <laughs> and we're doing a, more than 100 miles an hour at that point. Here are the solids. What's interesting, they've got 550 tons of propellant 
and they're burning that propellant at the rate of about five tons per second. So uh, that explains why they're giving us about six million pounds of thrust at this point. At about 150,000 feet, they detach. We're going about 3,000 miles an hour here. And uh, once they detach on the solids, it's a, a pretty rough, vibrant ride. And then it becomes a very smooth ride from there to orbit. First order of business uh, after getting to orbit is to convert our rocket ship into a laboratory or a, a satellite deployment platform in this case. And so we swing open the payload bay doors about an hour and a half after getting to orbit. Taco is uh, working with Rommel to convert the, the computers over to on-orbit mode while we're getting ready in the back to check out the arm and get the satellite out of the bay. Um, we are, uh, we grappled the SPA satellite about three and a half hours into the flight and uh, some checks were performed both by the crew and the ground. Mm -hmm. And here we are um, taking the satellite out of the payload bay and maneuvering to the release position. Tom, uh, of course, is assisting me here with the arm. Um, there, everyone in the crew is involved in the rendezvous, in the RMS deploys. But SPAS was a model satellite. The spacecraft uh, performed flawlessly. Um, the group of folks that we worked with in Germany were um, just incredible to work with, incredibly professional and enjoyable to work with. So we were pleased to be part of the, the SPAS, the Orpheus SPAS mission. Here we are maneuvering again the SPAS to the release position. Once SPAS is in the release position and our window for uh, release opens, this is the end effector view. We maneuvered the arm, we released the spacecraft, maneuvered the arm away from the SPAS, and then very shortly thereafter, approximately one minute, Taco fires some jets on the orbiter so that we would uh, uh, induce a separation velocity between the orbiter and SPAS and send it on, on its two-week mission of uh, astronomical observations. Here we are on the mid-deck, and this is the same secondary I'd mentioned earlier, running the, the capillary pump loop experiment. And here you can see it, and this is about as exciting as it ever got. <laughs> But it, it was a tremendous experiment run by the University of Maryland. Out in the payload bay, we had the space experiment module, a gas can type experiment with 10 experiments provided by students in high schools and colleges around the country. And they used microgravity to uh, great effect on our 18-day flight. Now here you see the sequence of uh, bringing the wake shield out of the uh, protective cone in the back of the payload bay, protecting the source cells that spray material onto the wafer growth surfaces on the the uh, wake side of wake shield. This is again flight day four. And the first place we took the wake shield satellite was over the port side, pointing into the ram direction so that the contamination on the bottom of the shield here would be cleaned off by atomic oxygen in orbit. After a couple of hours during free drift while we cleaned the uh, wake side of the satellite, we then swung it over to the other side of the uh, payload bay to check out the attitude control system. And so we were doing a constant series of RMS maneuvers with some pauses in between while the shuttle oscillated slowly in free drift, getting ready for the deploy sequence. And here we go over to the other side of the payload bay uh, towards the ADAX checkout or the attitude system checkout uh, location. You can see the Sahara sweeping by in the background. Tom was saying here we maneuver the arm and study where the weight shield thinks it is in terms of its attitude determination system and we watch the responses of the, uh, the satellite to the RMS. After going to the ADAX deploy, and then we go to a deploy position, uh, Tom has dropped it here, we study the attitude uh, determination and control system, its performance for one minute. We did get into a, uh, a little higher reaction speed here than planned, and as well we had an eight degree roll excursion, and so, uh, the Wake Shield community wanted to study this response for a few minutes longer. We did observe to watch the clearance with the uh, aft TV cameras. I'm waiting here to, uh, to start the thrusters. They're coal gas nitrogen thrusters, and here uh, the Wake Shield is thrusting away from the orbiter. It's a 20-minute burn. Here are the two satellites in formation with each other. After Wake Shield has been deployed, they're about uh, 15 or 18 miles apart at that point, and we're going to fly between those two to rendezvous with Wake Shield. Uh, 
as you can see, we, we do need to eat on board, but you can define your own uh, kitchen table upside down or, or, or not. And uh, we do have to keep things clean. We, Rommel here is vacuuming one of the filters that collects a little bit of dust on it. We just vacuum the dust off of it, uh, one of several filters in the, payload, in the um, crew compartment. Here on the aft flight deck, we have uh, all of our TV recording studio set up, four separate recorders to record SVS data that Tammy talked about earlier and all of this data was shipped back to the ground after landing. We had a number of orbit adjust burns to keep us in the proper position with these two satellites. Some of them were fairly long, as you can see the <coughs> plume from the exhaust over the nose there. And we, we use the computers to tell us what to burn, but then we make the burns manually. And you can see how the, uh, the firing of these little rockets uh, shake the vehicle. You can see the computer on the glare shield sliding around a little bit. What we're looking through there is the little gun sight. We got the reticle turned down fairly dim so that we can see outside well. And wake shield was showing up in the gun sight. And uh, we're flying up closer to it. Again, we manually are flying. And, and you can see Tammy in the uh, window next to me taking sightings with the police laser. When we get it down over the payload bay, it's time for Tom to go to work and grapple it. It's remarkable how smoothly our pilots brought this spacecraft uh, into the payload bay envelope. I'd never seen another spacecraft in orbit before, and this one was remarkable in its stability. Taco parked us right uh, underneath it, and then we rotate the RMS end effector, get it into the right orientation for grapple, and then it's just a matter of going and closing the grapple pin and uh, not bumping the satellite out of the way in the process. So here we are closing uh, over the grapple pin with the end effector. We trigger the snares and then bring the wake shield back aboard after its uh, three days of uh, material science. Once grappled to the arm, we can bring it back down into the payload bay, and we even use it the next day for some space vision system experiments. Our flight deck uh, teamwork is very important as we bring it down into the payload bay. We even had space vision system here providing us berthing cues in addition to the usual TV camera and RMS digitals that we use for uh, standard payloads. Wake Shield was really a, a joy to operate on the arm. Tammy's here uh, with one of our long lens telephotos, uh, Hasselblad camera, and we'll show you a few views of the Earth in the movie here too. <laughs> Notice the hygiene. Uh, hygiene's important in space also, so uh, the story was getting a little bit shaggy, so he's getting a, a little bit of a trim and a polish here. Also, I think you can define our crew as works well together. Uh, when we had an orange drink spill, everybody chipped in to help clean that spill up. As many of you know, Story was making his sixth flight on the uh, US space shuttle. And, and while we were on, on orbit, he passed over 1,000 hours of time in the space shuttle. So we, f we came up with this patch that says Master of Space and presented it to him. In a <laughs> little ceremony on board. Here we are on the mid-deck the day before the uh, flight day 10 scheduled EVA, um, applying antifog to our helmets and also getting our tools in the proper configuration in anticipation on the EV for the EVA and the next day. Uh, Tom here has the shuttle power tool and I'm holding the new uh, station power tool that has some enhanced capability but as you can see is quite a bit larger than the shuttle power tool. Um, we spent several hours getting our tools in the proper configuration and everything laid out to make EVA day uh, go much more smoothly and efficiently. Tom is donning his lower torso assembly, and it's always a bit of a squeeze getting into those pants. <coughs> and shortly you'll see my head pop out of the, uh, the upper torso. And Story, of course, uh, was instrumental in getting us suited up and prepared to go out the door. The uh, crew got into the airlock, we depressed the airlock, the RMS got in position to view crew egress, we went to open the hatch, the handle rotated about 35 degrees and came to a hard stop. This happened uh, over and over again, more times than I can count, and unfortunately we were never able to open the outer uh, airlock hatch and the EVAs were canceled for the flight. <coughs> Well, we wanted to uh, get off on time so that we could get you all home uh, 
for Thanksgiving, but you can probably blame me on that because this is my third Thanksgiving in space. But here we are eating a traditional turkey. I had flown uh, during Thanksgiving with John Blaha back in 89. I wanted to fly in space again, and I did get to fly with him, but on different vehicles. <clears throat> you all were nice enough to uh, patch us in with him. The moon from out there in space is very similar to the moon uh, down here on Earth. It goes through the same uh, phases, and we watch this moon grow to a totally full moon. This is a shot of Flight Day 15, and uh, this is the day when we're rendezvousing with Orpheus to bring it back. The uh, Taco was kind enough. We swapped roles during this rendezvous. So I was at the aft station, and uh, Taco was in the forward station until, and now you notice Taco's in the, in the picture, until we got within 100 feet. And then he took it for the talk socks and the graphic. Um, Rommel and Taco did an outstanding job with the rendezvous. They put the spacecraft uh, very, very steady um, into the end effector camera. All that was left to do was a quick maneuver. <laughs> and a grapple of the uh, Orpheus spas. Uh, post grapple, we did do a number of uh, maneuvers in support of some space station experiments, testing our SVS system, and uh, making sure that we could get very good position and attitude information out of the space vision system in order to facilitate some of the space station construction activities. And this is our final berthing of the spas. Let's take you back outside. We're going to give you some camera views of the Earth. Always in the background as we uh, maneuvered the spacecraft during our long flight. Looking down, we can see some very delicate linear dunes in western Algeria in the great western sand sea of the Sahara. This is a very early morning view. You can see the very delicate uh, sculpting of the dunes by the wind. A little bit farther to the east is a big outcropping of uh, black volcanic rock it's uh, dark gray because of iron and manganese in the rocks. And the Tiffernine dunes that are there on the right side, the thumb-shaped dune field, is red because of the iron in the sand grains reflecting light in a different way. And it's a very beautiful dune field bumping up against the hard rock of the mountains there. Over uh, Central Africa, we saw a lot of burning going on. You can see several smoke plumes uh, emanating from the, the rainforest area in Central Africa combined with the, the grasslands there. And, this was one of the hot topics we were looking for from space. We saw a lot of burning not only here, but also in Australia because it's the dry season there. A beautiful real-time sunset from Earth orbit. And now it's time for entry. Uh, we've got a small camera handheld in the cockpit that allows us to pan around and show you the orange-pink aerodynamic heating outside the front cockpit windows as we go through about Mach 15. Out the back windows, you can see the plasma tail trailing us behind. Uh, as the uh, hot plasma streams around the orbiter and goes back over the tail. It's a spectacular light show. During that time where you saw the plasma trail behind us, we were uh, tilted up at an angle of attack of about 40 degrees. Here we are looking out through a camera over the nose of the vehicle, and, and now the angle of attack is much lower, and we're flying more like an airplane. It is dark overhead, so the only way to see us was with an infrared camera, and that's what you see in the upper right inset in this uh, view. We continue to have the uh, camera that's looking over the nose operate all the way to landing. And you see some lights on the ground, uh, and you can see clearly why I called it a night landing. And just up towards the uh, upper right and moving to center, you can see a dim outline of a long, thin uh, light area, which is the runway. We are diving towards a set of lights about a mile and a half short of the runway, which are lit up by strobe lights. And at about 2,000 feet, we start a pull out to uh, shallow our steep dive angle, which is 18 degrees up to that point, to more of an airliner type uh, glide slope so we can land. At about 300 feet, uh, Rommel put the landing gear down, and this is our view as we're finishing that, that uh, pre-flare. On the left uh, is a, a string of lights with a little ball next to it, which uh, we're trying to line up and keep in the center so as to cross the runway at the right height at the threshold. And with the uh, Xenon lights providing the, uh, the bright glow on each side of us. Uh, here's the touchdown viewed from the, run the camera at the far end of the runway. You can see the, uh, the vapor trails being turned up in the humid Florida air. At about 200 knots uh, on the ground, Rommel deployed the drag chute, and at 185 knots, we started the nose down uh, to make a, 
to get all three wheels on the runway and we'll start steering down uh, trying to stay on the center line of the runway because it's nothing more embarrassing than have the final photos of the, of the vehicle not on the center line. <coughs> uh, <coughs> it's also helpful to stay out of the mud and the weeds. And <laughs> at about 60 knots, we release the drag chute so that it still has a good aerodynamic force on it, pulls it cleanly away from the vehicle so that it doesn't damage the engine bells. This is, after all, a reusable spacecraft. It was the 21st flight of Columbia the 80th flight of the space shuttle program. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much.